Hello and welcome to Wealthion's weekly market recap. I'm your host, Andrew Brill. I hope you enjoyed this week's roller coaster ride of ups and downs. Let's hear what our experts had to say about it this past week. We begin with Caitlin Long, who joined Speak Up with Anthony Scaramucci. Caitlin is an expert and advocate for cryptocurrency. She talked about the imbalance of supply and demand and how interest rates are misleading the economy. She also talked about strategies for lending with Bitcoin and how leveraging Bitcoin is a dangerous game. Also, she touched on the troubles she's had with government policies toward crypto and the battles she's come up against. Inflation is also running hot. Uh, and so uh, that's the dreaded stagflation. And we're seeing a, a tug of war between Janet Yellen and Jay Powell. She is executing stealth QE through the issuance of T-bills and the drawdown of the tre Treasury General account, which pushes fiscal stimulus into the economy. And Jay Powell, his job is to try to offset that uh, offset the inflationary effects of that. And so you actually have the, the Treasury and the Fed not in agreement, and that is an unusual situation. So it, talk to me a little bit about this, and and we'll get into custodial custodia bank and crypto, but there seemed to be a, a, a glut of money supply because of COVID. We pumped all kinds of money into the economy. And Janet Yellen's trying to do that again, but Jay Powell's saying, whoa, 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 wait a minute, slow this down. How do we combat this? You know, where do we go from here? The Obviously, FOMC is meeting. There's a consensus, maybe rate cut in September, not right now. But once that happens, things are going to start to tick up again, and inflation could rear its ugly head. Well, the old saying goes, uh, Milton Friedman saying, it's inflation is always in everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Uh, and a lot of folks will debate whether that's true. You certainly have things like, like real shortages that can cause inflation. But if markets are allowed to clear, that uh, those shortages will very quickly take care of themselves and clear. And, and so the honest truth is, the, all that spending that you pointed out, we didn't produce anything to back up that demand. And it's really simple. We did not have a supply of goods. I, I'm, I'm, of course, being, I'm overstating it, but a lot of folks were literally locked in during the COVID lockdowns, not producing. And everyone who works is part of producing GDP. And if we had a lot of folks literally not working, our, we obviously were not producing GDP. And yet all that stimulus came in to replace folks income. So the supply demand got way out of balance and that created inflation. Had we not done that and had folks actually ventured out to work, we would not have had as much inflation as we're dealing with now. This is absolutely the after effect of that huge, both fiscal and stimulus, monetary stimulus that took place during COVID. Are you a fan of a rate cut right now? Or do you think, you know what, just pump the brakes and I think we'll be okay? Well, I actually, I don't make forecasts for a living, but, I'll, but at a high level, I'll say this. The most important, the single most important price in the economy is the interest rate. That is the traffic signal that allows entrepreneurs to allocate capital across time and across industries. And that is the one price that should not be manipulated. It should be set by the free market. That is, the, when I say the one price, it is the most important price. And yet it is the price that is not allowed to be set by the market in the United States and in the Western world. And as a result, we get a lot of bad signals. I, I really, this hit home for me during the 2008 financial crisis when I was working on a trading floor at Morgan Stanley and understanding why is it that the entire home builder industry made the same investment mistake in the same direction at the same time? The answer is they all took the wrong signal from interest rates. I like the way Jesse Powell, the founder of Kraken says though, Sometimes you build bridges knowing that you won't need them forever and you might blow up one end of it. 
And that's kind of how I think about starting a bank. This is something, this is the really actually very, very heavy lifting. Uh, we knew it was going to be brutal from a regulatory perspective. It's been a lot worse than anticipated because we got targeted by, uh, by, by folks. We got caught up in something um, illegal and far bigger than ourselves, an overreaction to FTX by federal bank regulators uh, and a lot of illegal activity and unethical activity aimed at us. But uh, we're here for the fight and uh, we've been at it for a while and uh, there's light at the end of the tunnel. So explain to me, you know, lending with Bitcoin. Now, a, a bank and someone goes out, wants to buy a house. I don't have the $600,000 worth of Bitcoin to buy that house. Can you still lend? Because it's a peer to peer thing. Is there still lending that's going on or do, is the lender the peer to peer and I'm actually paying them interest back? In, in Bitcoin at some point. So, so two points. One is lending in a disinflationary asset like Bitcoin is it should only happen for reasons that, that are related to liquidity or tax planning. It shouldn't be for speculation. And the reason I say that is the moment you go above one to one leverage, if you take out more than one to one exposure, there will never be more than 21 million Bitcoins. And so you're insolvent. The lender is insolvent the moment that they do that. And we experienced that with BlockFi and Celsius, among others, that got themselves massively leveraged. And uh, then, the, then the, the proverbial bank run hit and they didn't have enough Bitcoin to pay off the, the customers who were withdrawing and uh, they went into bankruptcy. And I, I do fear that the big Wall Street firms are going to have to learn that lesson the hard way. We can come back and talk about that a little bit later because so many of the Wall Street firms are in the old paradigm, the old TradFi paradigm, which is, which is debt-based. Money in fiat money is all debt-based. If you want to have a mind bender, if, all, if the U.S. were ever to pay off all of its debt, there would be no money. Why? Because the dollar is an IOU. And so it's, it's, it's a debt instrument in and of itself. There's nothing backing it other than the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. But it's turtles all the way down, so to speak, that, in, in that regard. So it's purely a confidence game. There, there, there isn't anything backing it. There used to be gold, which was a valuable asset that tethered the amount of credit created in the U.S. dollar. And that's no longer the case, obviously, um, to the first question you asked, we've been on a gigantic money printing spree that will not be able to go on forever. Um, but but back to the, the the Bitcoin point, Bitcoin is an asset that does not. It's a different paradigm. It does not pay interest because it doesn't need to. It's a disinflationary asset. And what I mean by that is you can either have an inflationary asset like the dollar um, that deflates with inflation. You can have a disinflationary asset with a very low inflation rate that holds its value over time, or you can have a deflation, deflationary asset that actually shrinks in quantity. Bitcoin does not shrink in quantity. It, it, it does grow in, in quantity, I think, uh, just a little bit under 80 basis points, 0.8% per year right now. Gold grows at about 1.6% per year, so Bitcoin's inflation rate is half that of gold right now and the inflation rate gets cut in half every four years but it never goes to negative so i don't call it a deflationary asset but back to your question if that's the asset that you own an asset that 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 is growing in supply at a rate far slower than the rate at which fiat currency is growing in supply every year then that asset's going to hold its value it doesn't need to to have a yield in order for it to hold its value. So if, you, if, if you're investing in any Bitcoin product that has yield, because Bitcoin itself does not have yield, ask yourself, where is that yield coming from? And if it's coming from someone going more than one-to-one -one leverage, you should expect that counterparty to be insolvent. It's just a question of time before the market reveals that. And if you happen to get out before the, the run happens and the market reveals the insolvency of your counterparty, then you are lucky. But what is happening right now, just as a fair warning, is folks that got out of Celsius in the last couple of months of Celsius operations are now being sued personally by the bankruptcy trustee. So you, you, again, do your counterparty credit risk homework. Really understand if you're investing in Bitcoin that gives you yield, 
watch out. So how do we lend? How do we borrow, I guess, if, if, if I wanted to buy a house and I'm doing yep. it with Bitcoin, let's say Bitcoin becomes the currency. How do I do that? Ah, well, again, it's a new paradigm that's not a debt-based paradigm. Bitcoin is money that's no one's IOU. The dollar is money that is the U.S. government's IOU. Bitcoin is money that is not debt. The dollar is money that is entirely debt. So it's a completely different paradigm. So now the question becomes, in a Bitcoin world, would we actually have much in the way of debt capital markets? So let's let's pack, unpack that in a couple of different ways. Some folks won't want to sell their Bitcoin for liquidity reasons and might just want to borrow against the collateral, kind of the same way as you would take a home equity loan out against the collateral of your home. Uh, and some, uh, for tax planning reasons, don't want to sell it. A lot of people, uh, there are there. It's very easy in the Bitcoin network to determine who's in the money. In other words, who has unrealized gains, and the, you know anyone who bought Bitcoin. Um, uh, obviously at prices below where the price is today have an unrealized gain. And in a lot of cases, it's, it, it, if, it, if they're American, it's, an, it's a long-term unrealized capital gain. And so they don't want to have to sell it and pay the taxes. They'd rather borrow against the appreciated value. Those are two strategies that I know a lot of folks are using. And there are places, including Bitcoin, um, Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin native companies, that will lend against Bitcoin. They have um, they have U.S. dollar and Bitcoin based loans, uh, so that folks who don't want to trigger that capital gain can can temporarily borrow against the value of their Bitcoin. And I do know a lot of folks who are engaging in that. I will say though, I'm one of the the phrases that I'm somewhat famous for is a fool and his leveraged Bitcoin are soon parted. Um, at the Bitcoin conference three years ago on stage with Sam Bankman fried I coined that phrase and it kind of went viral when FTX failed because he was a fool uh, and his, he, his leveraged Bitcoin, uh, he and his leveraged Bitcoin were soon parted for sure. Uh, but uh, he, uh, it, the, the point is well taken that just don't go above one-to-one. -one. If you're going up to one-to-one, -one, you're fine. Uh, but don't go above one to one because the moment you do, you're in trouble. Caitlin, I know that you're not a big fan of Elizabeth Warren. I know that <laughs> she uh, she's dead set against crypto and right. she's in charge right now. But she says that crypto can be used to spy on the United States, to undermine homeland security and to launder money. You're now in an elevator with her. What are you saying, Elizabeth Warren, to change her mind? Well, I think she has a very different paradigm than I do. She has a paradigm where she wants total control. She wants total visibility into everything everyone does. She wants the ability to block people from speaking freely. And she wants the ability to block people from transacting with their own money freely. And she has said this. She wants a central bank digital currency. So to be honest, I'm not sure it's worth even having that elevator conversation with her. Jonathan Wellam of our partner RIA Rocklink Investment Partners joined Wealthion and thinks that the U.S. deficit can lead to a recession. He also explained that remote work has taken a severe toll on commercial real estate and regional banks. And there's an ongoing debate on whether or not the U.S. is going to slip into recession. What are your thoughts? If we step back and we, we don't get as preoccupied with recession or non-recession. Um, I mean, it, it, we think about it, but what, what's going on in the U.S. right now, which I think is, is what stimulating it more than almost anything, is these massive deficits. So, I mean, they're, they've got two trillion plus. I mean, it's probably two and a half trillion, if not more, of deficits that uh, they're incurring, which is, you know, it's, it's high single digits percentage of their total GDP. And so, you know, if you're spending that kind of money, which is completely and totally unsustainable, um, yeah, you can sort of make your economy look like it's a little stronger. And so if there's any kind of reasonable balancing of budgets, I don't, I'm, I'm not talking about a balancing budget, but even just pulling down the deficits, that economy would be in a recession um, and it would be much slower. They've also had a massive inflow of immigrants across the border. And so you've got government spending on the municipal level, the state level, and the federal level to support these 10 million, 15 million people across the border. So there's just a lot of stimulus going into that economy that uh, 
I think is there's no way it's sustainable. And so we when we look at buying businesses and buying investments, you know, we're going to discount that and try to be very careful about what we're prepared to pay and look for businesses that are not, um, you know, we're not inordinately impacted by some of those trends, which are, again are not sustainable. So in spite of this strong uh, Q2 GDP number, you think the U.S. economy is slowing down. And one of the things that uh, it's really impacting is the real estate price. And, and I want to speak about commercial real estate mm-hmm. prices. And this whole work from home thing, remote working, it's having a big impact right across the economy, especially with commercial real estate. Moody's recently came out with a report saying vacancy rates in the U.S. hit an all-time high of 20.1% in Q2. high, Or I should say the highest since 1979. That's when they started taking uh, those records. And then if you look at some cities like San Fran, everybody reads about the problems happening in San Francisco, but their vacancy rate now downtown is 35%. And that's up from 28% just a year ago. Even in uh, the city of New York, it's approaching 20%. And uh, I want to get your thoughts on this, what's happening within the commercial real estate. And if you think this can be, if this can lead to a, a much bigger problem in the U.S.? Well, I mean, it, it is a big problem, and there's no question about it. This numerically alone, it's a large issue, and it's and it's not going to go away because the trends I think are well established. I think if you talk to businesses, yeah, they want some people back in the office, but they're mu- they're very much prepared to have people work two to three days uh, in the office, and then the rest of the days back at home, and sometimes even less than that. And you get take a company, take an area like San Francisco. I mean, it's highly tech oriented. So if there, if there's any place you can work from home, it'd be sort of in a tech company. Um, and so, uh, and, and just the the power of the employees over the employer in some cases, if they're highly trained, um, they have a lot of leverage um, over the employees uh, over the employer in terms of where they want to work. So I think this is a longer term trend that is here to stay. And so therefore, we're going to have to burn through the excess. And if we burn through the excess, yeah, you want to be careful about who's holding uh, the bag in terms of these uh, buildings and who's going to have to take the write downs and write these off. And uh, in the United States, it's largely a lot of the regional banks. It's not as much the the massive, you know, the, the, the money centered banks, the large ones. Um, the J.P. Morgans of the world and so forth, uh, I think, are are much better positioned in terms of wet weathering this. But some of the regional banks, I'd be careful of. We don't own any, um, and I think that uh, yeah, there will be some write downs. I mean, it's been largely telegraphed to the market. We know it, so it is getting, I think, priced in uh, to some of the businesses. And you know, the uh, the businesses, you know, the banks do have a fair bit of capital that they can sort of weather this. I mean, our view has always been in the last couple of years is that the banks will just have a tough, tough time. We're not predicting they're going to blow up or anything like that. But it's just one of those areas we say, hey, do we really need to be here? Can we figure this all out? Or is it just easier to go somewhere else? It's like Warren Buffett often says he's got this pile on his desk and he says, you know, too hard, too hard pile. In some cases, uh, some of these businesses or industries and what's going to happen to try to spend all the time to figure out all the little nuances. Our view is, hey, if we can find a better area to invest in, a better business, it's more predictable. We don't have to spend all this time and uh, and then end up wrong at the end of it. Um, then we go somewhere else. But, you know, there's going to be a lot of write downs. You've seen the I mean, it's, it's horrifying to look at some of these real estate. Uh, uh, you know, they're worth five hundred million dollars a year ago. And now they're worth. 200 million. I mean, it's a $300 million reduction on something that's probably been leveraged, uh, you know, 75, 60, 75%. Um, I mean, that's basically wipes out all your capital. So, um, so yeah, this is going to have to run through the system. And we just warn people, be careful, just try to minimize your exposure to the businesses that are in that space. Um, and, and of course, this could lead to opportunities also, so bottom feeding and people being able to step in. But I think that's going to take a while because there's been a systemic change in the demand for that particular square foot of real estate. And that's not going to change anytime soon. So be very, very careful and watch your exposures and particularly leverage financials. Just watch what their exposure is to that space so you don't get stuck and, uh, and get disappointed. I mean, just having an investment that goes nowhere um, for the next couple of years would be a horrible thing too, right? This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. In these crazy times we live in, it's probably the last thing on your mind, you and your self-care. We all deal with it, work, kids, obligations, bills, you name it, everything takes priority except you. If you've ever worked out or been an athlete, you've heard the saying, never skip leg day, but how about never skipping therapy day? That's right, I'm talking about taking care of you, Talking to someone who will help ease some of your burden so you can get back to what it is that makes you happy. 
I talk to a therapist, and it really helps to take the edge off everyday life. Maybe you're going through something and can't really pinpoint what it, what it is that's bothering you. If you need to talk to a professional or thinking about giving therapy a try, give BetterHelp a try. It's easy, entirely online, convenient, and flexible to fit your schedule. Just fill out the questionnaire and get matched to a licensed therapist anytime. Never skip therapy day with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Wealthion today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash Wealthion. James Bianco of Bianco Research spoke to us this week and reiterated what Jonathan Wellam had to say about the commercial real estate sector affecting the regional banks. He also touched on the move of cash from large companies to small cap stocks and inflation versus unemployment. He also talked about politicians weaponizing Bitcoin. Many of the banks already reported here in the last couple of weeks, and we saw very good numbers out of JP Morgan, Citi, Goldman Sachs. Many of these banks are trading significantly above the S&P, so pretty big outperformance. Are you surprised by how these U.S. financials are performing in this environment? not surprised by how they're performing. I mean, let's also put into perspective that the banks, especially ex-JP Morgan, had been horrible underperformers for the last two years or so. They've been awful to own them. And so they're finally starting to get a rebound. And a lot of that rebound is coming with this big rotation that we've seen out of the MAG7 stocks and into the smaller cap stocks as well. The other hope that the banks have is the belief, and it's not incorrect, that the inverted yield curve, which has been now almost two years, is getting close to uninverted. And if banks borrow short and lend long, that would actually help their net interest margins uh, as well. So the banks, I'm not surprised at the rebound that they've had. They've been down for so long. And with the rotation and the hope for net interest margins, NIM, helping that they are going to, to you rebound. Now, whether or not that can be sustained, say, through the end of the year and into 2025, uh, I have my doubts on that. But for right now, they've been a very good place to be. And I think over the near term, they will continue to be. And were there any concerns when you look at a J.P. Morgan or a Wells Fargo, any concerns in terms of their loan books? No, not really at this point. I mean, the only concern that you would have is to get all around commercial real estate, especially office. But that is such a well-known story at this point. And it is so in the, in the price of the stocks. In other words, office is a disaster. And the banks have a huge problem because of office. But as I pointed out earlier, they've been suffering terribly for the last two years or so, in part because of that. So yes, that is an issue. But I don't think that what they reported should make us think that it's better or worse than the already glum outlook that we had for office real estate. So in Toronto, still a big issue with people going back to work. Um, if you look at any major office building in downtown Toronto, on a Monday, you might get 10% of the tenants going to work. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, it's 50 to 60%. And then on a Friday, it's down to 5%. How does that compare to what's happening in Chicago? Same thing. Same thing everywhere, you know, in pretty much the developed world right now. Or maybe I shouldn't be that broad. I should say more like North America. Um, you know, remote work is a thing. It is not going, we're not going back. We're not going to go back to where we were in 2019 or anything like that. So that this is part of the issue around office real estate. That if companies are only utilizing, as you pointed out, maybe 50% of their office space on a weekly basis. In other words, if you have 100 employees, you'd have 500 visits to your office a week, employees five times a week, and you're getting about 250 visits a week to your office from your employees. You're only half utilizing your space. And so there's been a downsizing you've seen of a lot of uh, employers on their space. And I don't think we're going to go back. We're not going to go back on this. Um, people have asked me, oh, but what about the next recession? Won't everybody come crawling back to the office? Like, no, it'll be worse. The next recession, your employer will say, I can't give you a raise, but take another day a week at home. And you'll think that he gave you a raise. 
If you want people to come back to the office, tell them that they get paid X, but if they come to the office every day, you'll give them 15% more money. But nobody thinks that way. So since we're not going to pay them a premium to come to the office, we're not going to see this remote work thing go away. A lot of this money that's been flowing out of NVIDIA and other, the other large caps, it's going into the small caps. And Russell has put in a nice move here in the last couple of weeks. And I'm really surprised given that a lot of the smaller cap stocks are have a higher risk level. They, their cost of capital is much higher. How do you explain this? Why is the Russell putting in such a good move? So <laughs> the simple answer is I can't. But I'll offer you an, a simple. Uh, um, I'll offer you some ideas. First of all, let's talk about the rotation out of like the Mag Seven and the big cap stocks into the small cap stocks. It's the largest ever measured by many different metrics. Whether you're looking at the outperformance of the Russell 2000 to the Russell 1000, or maybe the Mag Seven stocks to um, you know the um, uh, the Nasdaq Composite or something like that to the Russell 2000 or Mag Seven stocks to the 2000. So you've seen this gigantic move that we've never seen to this degree. And all of the other moves that were behind it a little bit smaller were 2020, 1987, 2008. In other words, when do small cap stocks massively outperform large cap stocks? When the stock market is collapsing and big cap stocks go down a lot faster than small cap stocks. This time it's been when both have been rising, well, or at least um, you know a, a four percent correction in big cap stocks and a big vertical rise in small cap stocks. So even that's unprecedented to see that kind of rotation. So now that I've said that this is wholly unlike anything we've seen before, what do I think could be behind it? My best guess is the ETFization of the stock market, in that it all started really on July 11th. July 11th was when the shocking CPI report came out at negative one-tenth of a percent. And I think that pretty much hundreds of thousands of investors looked at that number and hundreds of thousands of investors in the same minute came to the same idea. Oh, this means the Fed has to cut rates. And since they are going to cut rates and lower the cost of capital, this is going to help more traditional companies. So therefore, I am going to buy IWM the Russell 2000 ETF, or RSP, the S&P equal weighted ETF, or something along those lines. So basically, everybody got the same idea for the same two or three trades all at the same moment and all rushed into it. And we saw this massive rotation unlike we've ever seen before. Now, of course, I'm surmising this. I'm conjecturing this because we've never seen this before. And we don't really understand what quite happened, but that's my best guess as to what I think happened. So the last time we spoke, you made mention of the fact that if the unemployment rate goes from 4% to 5%, that's going to cost the economy 1.7 million jobs. But inflation at 3% or 3.5% or 4%, that impacts 300 million people. Right. And, you know, keep in mind that if the unemployment rate goes from 4 to 5, that means you have an extra 1.7 million unemployed people. But based on what I said before, some of those 1.7 million could just be new entrants to the country without a job, as opposed to somebody who actually had a job and lost a job. But that's what, where you're going. But the comment that I made before was that people have, don't appreciate that when the inflation rate stays to three, three and a half percent, that impacts 100 percent of the population. Even Elon Musk, the world's richest man, is impacted by inflation because he's going to see prices at Tesla and prices at SpaceX and prices at Twitter squeeze his margins. People that are on public assistance are going to see prices at the stores that they shop at go up faster than their public assistance, and they're going to get squeezed. And everybody, 100% of the population, is hurt by 3 to 3.5% three inflation. Whereas if the unemployment rate goes from 4 to 5%, 1.7 million people are hurt. Maybe it's less than that because of the migrant thing. And to give you the crass calculation I was talking about at the last call that we had together, is that if you told 300 million people, 1.7 million people need to take some pain, so the other 298 
you know, 0.7% of the people could see some inflation relief, they'd probably say, sorry, you 1.7%, but the other 298 million could definitely use some inflation relief. The point I'm trying to make by making it this way is inflation is worse than unemployment and inflation needs to be arrested, even at the cost of unemployment. If it comes to that, it hasn't yet. And therefore, the Fed should be on the lookout to try and arrest this high unemployment, uh, inflation rate, excuse me. But they don't seem to be. They seem to be thinking that it, the, the, the war is over, that it has been won, and that they're now start, starting to talk about cutting rates. And I, again, I'll just emphasize, I don't think we're there yet and they shouldn't be doing it. But like I said, I don't get a vote at the Fed. They seem to be ready to be cutting rates. You always have an opinion on Bitcoin, so I got to ask you about this. Trump was one of the keynote speakers at the Bitcoin conference in Nashville recently, and he had a lot of positive comments to say about it. And he was even alluding to the fact that he would initiate a strategic reserve fund similar to what they have for oil or even gold. What are your thoughts on that? So, and what are your thoughts on Bitcoin? Yes, you you undersold it. Trump went to Nashville, the big Bitcoin conference and told them everything they wanted to hear. He's going to fire Gary Gensler. He's going to get the industry involved in writing regulations for crypto. He's going to have the government never sell any of the crypto that they've acquired over the years because of fraud, which is the basis of this national, um, national fund. He loves crypto. He said, I love crypto. He said he's going to end Operation Choke Point 2.0, which is where the government has been cracking down on any bank that services a crypto um, uh, you know, services a crypto firm. Uh, it, you know, so he gave them everything he wanted, and the price ain't going anywhere. Now, part of the reason the price ain't going anywhere might also be that at the same time he was doing this, and the Democrats were offered Kamala Harris come to speak to our conference. She refused or turned them down, to be more specific. And just today, the day we're recording, price is getting crushed. Because the government has now moved some of the uh, crypto that it owns to another wallet, which is supposedly a prelude of selling it. The reason the government owns crypto is they acquired it through Silk Road and Mt. Gox. These were you know, famous frauds in the crypto space where the government investigated the frauds and then wound up acquiring that, that, that Bitcoin through those frauds. So it's almost like Trump said on Saturday, I'll never sell Bitcoin. And the Democrats on Monday are saying, fine, we'll sell our Bitcoin right now. So it's almost like back in your face. Now, the reason I, I express it that way is it's looking like if you are interested in betting on the election, you know, whether Trump will win or Harris will win, it, Bitcoin has become now the measure that you could do it. It's become so politicized that it's almost like an election futures on whether or not Trump or Harris is going to win um, over the next few months. And that's a problem for Bitcoin because it's getting wrapped up in politics. It always wanted to be this nonpartisan, decentralized, freedom of choice kind of asset. And all of a sudden, it's starting to look like a Republican asset that the Democrats are attacking because it's a Republican asset. This is a problem for Bitcoin as we move forward. Now, let me come back. I own Bitcoin. I own some cryptocurrencies. I am very bullish on the specter. I like the alternative financial system that they're building. I think that it is needed. The disruption is worthwhile, but it constantly gets sidetracked with these kind of things that I just described. And it just makes the eventual creation of this alternative financial system that much harder and that much further out into the future. Do I still think they can do it? Yes. But all I keep doing is just pushing out my time frame, saying, oh, man, no more time where it's just going to meander about or maybe sell off and it isn't quite going to get there. And it's just going to take longer and longer and longer to do it. Now, eventually, if it just keeps doing this forever, you might start to think maybe it'll never do it. I'm not there yet. I'm not quite that pessimistic, but you know, don't test it. Don't keep. Don't keep getting sidetracked by becoming a Republican asset or something like that to make people start to doubt whether or not you'll ever fulfill that promise 
of being an alternative financial system. So Bitcoin has been struggling since March. It hit 74,000 in March. As we're recording, it's around 66,000 right now. It hasn't been able to make any forward progress. It's had the halvening or it's had its inflation rate. It's had the success of the new ETFs. It has had Trump, who's, who is the leading candidate to be president, give the Bitcoin conference everything they've ever wanted. And I would almost, and people say, it's going to go to 100,000. And my answer is, why isn't it already there now? What more does it need to get to 100,000? It is it making this progress because there's a lot of other messy cross currents that are getting in its way. First timer, Kathy Lien, Managing Director at BK Asset Management, explained the slowdown of oil prices, US dollar and policies, and also central banks hoarding gold and driving up the gold prices. And I want to ask you about the price of oil now because it's been hanging in between seventy to eighty dollars a barrel, and there's a lot of speculation as to why it's still so low. And some people are saying it's because of a slowing economy, a global economy, and a slowdown in China too. And others are saying, well, it has to do with mani manipulation going on with the uh, Biden administration, right? They're letting, they're selling more oil into the um, global markets, and that's keeping the price down or suppressing the price. Do you think, well, what are your thoughts on the oil price here? I think that the slowdown in China and their lack of um, real substantial stimulus is playing a very big role in the pressure that we're seeing in oil prices. Um, they This month, they had their third plenum. And traditionally, what this big meeting, the third plenum, these plenums are supposed to um, provide is the platform to announce major stimulus packages. And the Chinese government fell short of that. There was a lot of expectations going into this meeting. And even though they you know, see all of the red flags, they see their economy slowing. For one reason or the other, they have not decided to come out with that major fiscal stimulus package that the economy needs. So, you know, stock markets have been disappointed, oil markets have been disappointed, and investors have been disappointed. So I think China plays a very large role in this. And um, yes, they came out later on and they, you know, kind of reduced, you know, some of their interest rates on the short term and long term basis. But it's not the on the ground fiscal stimulus that is needed to really jumpstart the economy. So I think that combined with the fear that the U.S. economy is also so slowing, so it's a reality that China's slowing, along with the fear that the U.S. is slowing, I think are playing the biggest um, role in the pressure on oil. Of course, you know, all the thoughts around what the Biden administration doing is not helping either. But I think the bigger story is really global growth at the end of the day. So I want to talk about foreign exchange now. That is your focus. And I want to get your views on the U.S. dollar and the U.S. dollar in relation to other currencies. And um, I guess the U.S. dollar has been relatively strong. Now, Trump, he's, of course, he's out uh, campaigning. And, and one of the policies he's saying he's going to implement if he becomes president is that he's going to weaken the U.S. dollar and therefore stimulate um, manufacturing at home. And uh, I want to get your views on that. Yes. I mean, I think that is one of the um, greatest potential impact if he wins the election, which is that unlike, you know, um, Biden or some other presidents who have st uh, stood steadfast to the U.S.'s strong dollar policy, um, Trump, as well as Vance, um, have been quite clear that they support a um, weaker dollar. And so, you know, there is, you know, while the president doesn't have a direct impact, on, um, you know, dollar policy. And, you know, the direction of the dollar is much more contingent upon where interest rates are headed than um, trade policies, especially near term trade policies. I think, you know, as a result of the election um, outcome, if Trump wins, that we could certainly see a knee jerk decline in the dollar. The dollar's had a really great run in 2024. We're nearing the election. And I think that, you know, you're starting to see an unwind in the greenback. And if we do see um, the polls show um, a clear Trump victory, that could also facilitate a further unwind, especially if it is tied with a Fed easing cycle. So I think that the um, landscape that we're seeing on a political as well as economic and monetary perspective does start to favor um, dollar weakness in the second half of the year. 
Okay, I want to move on now and I want to get your thoughts on gold because we can't talk about the U.S. dollar without discussing gold. And uh, there's a very strong negative correlation between the U.S. dollar and gold. Gold is still up, I think, around 15% on the year. And this move is, once again, predicated on lower interest rates, which will result in a lower dollar and a higher gold price. But I want to get your views on gold right now. What are your thoughts? I think that's where it is. It's exactly what you said, which is that with the prospect of U.S. interest rates falling, the U.S. dollar, you know, probably seeing, seeing its peak, I think that we're going to see, you know, more gains in gold prices. But it's not just that. It's also the possibility of a deeper correction in stocks. September is a, is one is historically one of the worst months in the stock market. August is um is neutral to slightly negative. Uh, July tends to be a really good month for stocks, and we saw that. So we're moving into a period where equities are vulnerable. And when equities are vulnerable, that tends to be really good for, um, you know, gold. And so I think, you know, going into um, September, a little less August, but more into September, we should see, you know, more um, demand for, you know, diversification. As investors look at interest rate cuts, they look at slowing growth, they look at the weakness and the lack of return in equities, um, and they you know, turn to gold for diversification. And I got to ask you about the central bank buying, because this is another reason why it's been moving higher. But in 2022 and 2023, 25% of all gold production has come from central banks. And I guess my question to you is, do you think the central banks are keeping prices artificially high by acquiring it so aggressively? Because when you look at the gold equities or the gold mining stocks, they're not pricing in $2,400 gold. The price they're factoring in is much lower, like 16, depending on the stock and whose research you're looking at, it could be anywhere from 1600 to 1800. I think absolutely. Central bank buying has been one of the greatest, um, uh, you know, supporting factors for gold. And I don't think that that's going to change anytime soon. I think the political landscape and who becomes the president um, for the next four years is going to affect that as well as U.S. international relations, you know, start to affect central bank buying. Um, but for the most part, I think, you know, a lot of countries around the world, especially the ones that don't have the most favorable relationships with the U.S., have seen um a good reason to diversify out of U.S. dollars. And if they see the landscape and they see that the dollar is potentially weakening, which, you know, before they may feel like it's more FOMO or they're missing out on the strong dollar rally. Now they're seeing the Federal Reserve is stepping up to the gate and they're lowering interest rates and there's diminishing returns in the greenback. That may give them an even stronger case to um, diversify into gold. Thank you for watching this week's recap. And don't forget to head over to Wealthium.com for a free no obligation portfolio review with one of our registered investment advisors. And please follow us on social media for the latest news and information to help you invest wisely. If you haven't done so already, please make sure to like and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget to hit the notification bell so that you don't ever miss a video. Thanks again for watching. Until next time, stay informed, be empowered, and may your investments flourish. If you like this content and are looking for more ways to keep growing your investments, watch this video next.